Welcome, everybody. Good morning to you. It's great to see so many of our familiar faces and to see some new names and faces. Um, it's really good to gather with you together right before the end of the year, right before our new year begins. Um, I'm Rabbi Sarah Berman. I'm the director of adult education here at Central Synagogue, and it is truly a pleasure and an honor to be joined by our three guests this morning. The protests in Israel over judicial overhauls about really more than that, a vision of a future of the country have roiled Israeli society since January of this year. What are these protests? How are they impacting society? Who is on the ground? Well, we're going to hear from three of them today. Rabbi Nama Kelman, the first woman ordained a rabbi in Israel and the recently retired Dean of Hebrew Union College's Jerusalem campus, also a guest on our Bima this Friday night for Rosh Hashanah services. Rabbi Kelman will be our host and moderator. Joining her are Michal Muscat Barkan, the head of education and professional development at HUC in Jerusalem, and the co-founder of Safeguarding Our Shared Home Jerusalem Protest Movement. And our final guest, who will uh, be familiar to so many of us, our friend Orly Erez Lachowski, the executive director of the Israel Religious Action Center and the former chief litigator for Iraq. Um, we are here this morning to hear from these three, to learn from them, and to uh, see, see perhaps a path forward um, in light of these protests. Nama, it's all yours. Thank you, Rabbi Berman and Central Synagogue for this important, essential opportunity to be in conversation with American liberal Jews. I think this is one of the first and very important realizations of the Israeli protest movement as it has evolved over nine months, how, how, much, how crucial it is that we be in conversation with our partners uh, in the US. Um, so I just wanna underscore how Michal Mushkat Barkan, professor, of education and uh, jurist uh, Orly Erezlovkovsky have been on the front lines of this protest. Of course, Orly will share with us her frontline work over decades um, in, in the bigger picture, which we will discuss. What, what are we really protesting? So that, that is my opening question. And actually, I want to open with Michal because she's less known to uh, a central synagogue in our movement, but she is a faculty member of Hebrew Union College. And so Michal, let's get some context here. What crisis are we facing? And um, what is what are we protesting? And perhaps a word, and we can expand later, what has been unique about the Jerusalem protest movement? And then I'll turn to Orly. Michal. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rabbi Nama Kerman, and uh, thank you for uh, creating this opportunity to, to talk because uh, we are nine months uh, in, a, in a tremendous, maybe the, the biggest protest ever. One of the, our speakers this uh, Saturday night, a professor of um, uh, Madame Dina. Political science. Political yeah. science. He said that he compared all the um, uh, protests and he, he said this is the maybe the longest uh, protest ever. So we are nine months protesting uh, against an attack of many of Israel's key institutions, the judicial independence, the freedom of the press, freedom of religion, budgetary priorities, uh, freedom of education. This is a multi-level attack that threatens every aspect of our lives here in Israel. And that is why people of really different political and religious backgrounds uh, have decided to step up and uh, take a stand. So I wanna say that uh, Israel now, as I, I think it's not only my feeling, uh, is uh, struggle, struggling for independence uh, after 75, years of independence. So we are struggling to bring back the, the, the to, to live according to the Declaration of Independence and 
fundamental questions of identity are playing now a dramatic, uh, playing out in a dramatic way. Things that we thought that are, uh, you know, agreed upon everybody about uh, Israel being the democratic, Jewish and democratic state are now uh, being questioned. So the huge protest in Israel is an expression of, in my understanding of both uh, threat, but also of hope, and I may may talk about that later. And I feel that we are in a historic moment. That we need to understand that uh, that if if we are continuing in this protest, we will succeed because the Israeli population is out in the streets every week, and sometimes many more than once a week outside without any violence, but so many people are out there for nine months every week. So this is the protest. I wanna, um, I wanna put in the chat and uh, maybe I can get a help. Uh, so you have uh, much more background that 20, 225 proposed laws cause, causing so much concern. So you can see in how many areas, and maybe Orly may talk about that later, just looking at that makes us understand that we are really in a, in a serious struggle in all areas of our lives. So if I wanna say something about the Jerusalem protest, or you want me to say that before? If you wanna oh, briefly, okay. yeah. yeah. So why, so why guess, the Jerusalem protest is yeah. unique, and we can talk about how that expanded okay. nationally over time. Okay. So I may just show you, uh, share this uh, this uh, picture of one of the huge protests that people just around from all over the country to the to the Knesset to um, to the protest. You can see this is the Knesset, and it's all surrounded by people who came from all over Israel. And and uh, something more that is unique about uh, about this protest just a second. Uh, is, uh, is and, and this is national, it's not only in Jerusalem, is reclaiming back all our symbols because you can see that we sing the anthem every every protest, it starts or ends with the anthem with the tikva and we come with the flags and everybody is, is, this is a protest about loving Israel, about loving our country and our state and about fighting for its future. So. Uh, if I can say something about the symbols that you can see here, this is the Declaration of Independence. This is the way we decided to celebrate Yom Ha'atzma'ut. We did a protest, walking and signing again the, the Declaration, Declaration of, Independence. of Independence. Yeah, the Declaration of Independence. So, and, and if you see here the shirts of these people standing here, these are brothers in arms uh, or people who fought, fought in, the, in, the, in the wars and they are fighting now for the future of Israel. So all these symbols are crucial for, the, for understanding that we are fighting not against, but in favor of Israel, in favor of the state of Israel. So if I'm, I wanna say something specific about Jerusalem, uh, so uh, what you can see here is the faces of the people that, uh, stood up, you know, just four weeks in, in Jerusalem on the stage and, and spoke. So you can see here in these faces what really is uniqueness in our, uh, in our crowd. We are bringing together in Jerusalem, since Jerusalem is a city that its population is so varied. We have so many Haredi and religious people, we have Arab people, we have secular reform, uh, conservative people. So we try to bring all these groups together and to give them a representation on the stage. And, uh, and, we, and also we decided that uh, all our demonstrations are in front of the president's house in front of Buzi Herzog House, which is also a national symbol because we want to say, this is a struggle for uh, really all our symbols. We, we want to uh, work towards great agreements in, the, in, this, in our society. 
And uh, we thought at the beginning, when we started uh, protesting in at this location, we thought there need to be someone, an, an adult, a responsible adult that may help this crisis. And then uh, he, he really uh, tried to do that. Michal, Michal, we'll talk about the, those invocations later. I really want to turn to Orly now. Please. Okay. You know, what role the president may have. We might be able to talk about the president of Israel. So I would thank you very much. I think you've got a taste now and we'll expand on why Jerusalem is unique and it's pluralistic speakers week after week. Uh, you rest assured that our reform movement has been well represented uh, on that stage. And by the way, all over the country, more and more of our rabbis speak at the uh, demonstrations. I'll, let, I'll turn to Orly now, again, asking, what is the crisis? What are we protesting? And obviously, an update from you from the Supreme Court, the 13-hour marathon um, on uh, Tuesday. Thank you. So hi everyone, it's such a pleasure uh, to be here with everyone, all of you. Um, it's always uh, it's always a pleasure um, and to be here with uh, Naama and Michal. Uh, so uh, you know we have been uh, fighting for many many years uh, for Israel's democracy and for to promote equality um, and, and freedom of religion, but um, it's clear that a period like this uh, we never encountered. And I think the the main issue is that we've been fighting extremism, uh, religious extremism for many years on all its different faces, whether it's, you know, infringement of women's rights and racism and infringement of LGBTQ rights and the Orthodox monopoly. But now uh, practices and phenomena which have been on the fringes of Israeli society have become completely center stage and are, are actually power, uh, part of the government. And uh, uh, things that maybe people were ashamed to say are now just, you know, upfront and uh, considered legitimate by some some uh, parts of Israeli society. Uh, and this is what really creates a very uh, uh, troubling and concerning situation uh, like never before. Uh, it is, as, as I think uh, Michal already mentioned, really brings up uh, basic issues of the identity of Israel as a democracy, as the state of all Jews from all over the world, uh, homeland of all Jews, uh, in, in really all, all its uh, uh, force like, like never before. Um, we've seen this government has been sworn in um, over eight months ago, um, and reading through the coalition agreements, we mapped a lot of threats, some of which already materialized, some of which are still going, uh, might, may, might be materialized because the Knesset is now uh, uh, in break and is going to go back for the winter session right after Sukkot for a very long session, seven months long, uh, and we are uh, very concerned, of course, that the government is going to promote a lot of issues uh, such as uh, uh, revoking recognition of non-Orthodox conversion after uh, many years of struggle through which we gained such recognition, um, different issues of uh, education, which has already been mentioned, uh, trying to uh, prevent liberal education from being taught in uh, schools, in public schools in Israel, and rather pushing for uh, racist and homophobic uh, program uh, and deepening the orthodox monopoly. The government is now pushing for a law to have more and more rabbis being appointed by the government. Of course, all of them would be orthodox men. Uh, issues of women's rights have come to the surface very dramatically in the past few weeks. A lot of incidents of exclusion of women, of discrimination of women on buses, on airplanes. Um, and in many other areas, the government wants to amend the anti-discrimination law to actually allow gender segregation and to, and to uh, expand it. Um, issues of LGBTQ, a lot of incitement um, and attacks uh, against LGBTQ people and uh, racism ha has also become uh, such a widespread phenomenon. Just last week, the public um, TV channel aired um, a piece about uh, um, a, an organization in Ma'ale Adumim next to Jerusalem, uh, which has you know, its, its goal to take Arabs out of Ma'ale Adumim, out of the city, allowing them to work there, but God forbid not allowing them to stay or go to the gym there or, or go to the parks. Really horrific, horrific uh, issues, which are now you know, part of the government. Uh, so all of this is very, very concerning. But you know, we have been, of course, fighting this alongside many, many others. Uh, we have been fighting this uh, in the Knesset first and foremost. Um, of course, the government, as uh, um, the judicial coup, was a very big uh, a part of the last uh, session of the Knesset. 
a lot of laws. Uh, the government wanted to push for a lot of laws to weaken the Supreme Court, to weaken the gatekeepers, such as the Attorney General, um, and to gain control over the committee uh, nominating judges. Uh, they We spent a lot of hours in the Constitutional Law and Justice Committee, which in and of itself is a very, very, very hard experience because it is run by a member of Knesset Simcha Rotman, who runs it in a very, very rude and violent manner. Um, so we, we've been, of course, there opposing uh, the legislation and filing position papers. Uh, we've been opposing a lot of other problematic laws, such as laws uh, wanting to abolish the authority for the advancement of women, trying to politicize this body, uh, and, and a lot of uh, other problematic laws. Uh, we have been, of course, we're continuing to go to the courts uh, to, to um, promote our cases on the different issues of equality to the reform movement, of fighting uh, exclusion of women um, and racism. And of course, we've been out there in the streets. The Israeli reform movement has been part of the protest from the first day, from the uh, day the government has been sworn in. And we are uh, out there with many of our congregations in different uh, protests around the country every Shabbat for 36. This is going to be now the 37th week. Uh, we're holding Havdalah ceremonies uh, right before uh, the protest begins at the end uh, of Shabbat. And those are very moving uh, ceremonies. Uh, we are holding webinars to educate both the Israeli public and, you know, like what we're doing now with a lot of people from outside of Israel wanting to know more about the situation. Uh, our, our slogan is we're protecting democracy in the name of Judaism, uh, because uh, we what we're saying is what the government is doing is not only undemocratic, it's also not Jewish, because this is not our Judaism. We do not believe in a Judaism which is extremist and which is misogynistic, racist, and homophobic. Um, and another thing before I talk about the uh, hearing at the Supreme Court is that we're now focusing on the municipal elections. We're going to ha have municipal elections in six weeks in Israel, all over Israel, in 250 municipalities. And we are making sure to uh, engage and mobilize as many uh, congregants from all over the country as possible to make sure we increase voter turnout. Uh, we tell the candidates uh, to mayors that they have to make sure the municipal uh, arena, the municipal sphere is going to be a liberal one, which respects different forms of Judaism and, of course, women's rights um, and people who are not, not Jewish. Uh, and we want to make sure that all of this, at least on the local level, will be promoted. And that's an amazing um, uh, opportunity. Another thing that we are doing is we're focusing on racist candidates to the municipal elections and asking to disqualify them, uh, as we did on the national level a few years ago. Talking about the Supreme Court, we had a very, very uh, interesting week. Two days ago, um, the Supreme Court ha heard petitions on the issue of the unreasonableness clause. So this was actually the first law of the judicial coup that has been passed by the coalition in July. Uh, the reasonableness clause is basically a, gra a legal ground for the court to intervene in uh, illegal governmental or ministerial decisions in cases where not all relevant considerations have been taken into account. And this, the court used it to actually uh, strike down decisions which are either biased or cases of conflict of interest or corrupt. Um, and what the new law uh, says is that basically the court cannot do it anymore. And so governmental and ministerial decisions are going to be completely immune from judicial review. Uh, this has been done through a basic law. Basic law in Israel is supposed to be part of the constitution, so a higher than a regular law. But in fact, it's been enacted like a regular law, and it could be amended very easily. So it's just a regular law with a special title, basic law. However, the, the court in Israel never, up until now, has never struck down basic laws. It did strike down laws, but not a law which is tied to basic law, which is supposed to be of a higher normative status. And that's why it, it was such a big deal. The court convened for the first time in Israel's history with a full panel of 15 justices, all justices of the court set together. Um, in contrast to what happens in the States, in Israel, they never sit with a full panel of justices, usually three judges, and in important cases, five, seven, nine, or 11 judges. So this was, um, you know, they didn't, have, they even had to change the chairs because physically there was no space in the courtroom for all judges to sit together. And they sat and heard for 13 hours, uh, eight petitions against um, the, the law. Uh, of course, the uh, petition said that this is an extreme case where a basic law is, is so violates the very concepts of Israel as, dem as a democratic country uh, because it hurts the separation of powers and the rule of law and human rights. Uh, and that's why the court should intervene. 
the Knesset and the government of court opposed. It's important to note that the attorney general who is supposed to represent, represent the government uh, refused to do so and sided with the petitioners in a very um, uh, un unconventional manner. Uh, and so the government had to hire a private attorney to represent it. And actually the attorney, uh, I think he did a very, very bad job. He actually said that the declaration of independence didn't mean anything because it was uh, drafted in a hasty manner and it was signed by people who were never elected. And the whole day was very, very interesting and fascinating. And we had a lot of questions and discussions by the judges, sometimes among themselves. The judges uh, were less cautious than usual. They um, they said a lot of things on like seeing the big picture, not only this specific law, but rather the intentions of the coalition to pass a lot of other laws which could hurt Israel's democracy. One judge uh, said uh, when the attorney of the government told him, you're making you know such a big deal, it's not such a catastrophe. And he said, well, democracies don't always go down with strong blows. They could die in a very small incremental steps. So there were a few really, really important sentences said by the, the justices. Obviously, uh, some of them were very disturbed. It's unclear to know what the result would be. Okay, we're now waiting for the court's decision, which could take a few months. Um, it seems that there is a, quite a large number of judges who are very troubled by the law. Uh, the more conservative judges probably would not intervene, and some judges could try to find a middle ground, like uh, interpret the, the, the law in a more narrow manner, so not to completely uh, strike it down, but rather make it uh, a, a narrower version, uh, and we'll have to wait and see, but it was definitely a, a historic uh, decision, um, a historic day, and the fact that Israelis actually, you know, instead of watching a reality show, they just sat in front of the TV and saw a he legal hearing the whole day was just unbelievable. I mean, it never happened uh, before. Um, yeah, that's for now. I'll continue later. Thank you, Orly, for your passionate, <laughs> wonderful presentation. Maybe I'll just take a moment to summarize why perhaps this is overwhelming and confusing. But again, we're going to also focus now on the surprises and the promise and the opportunities that uh, the developments uh, have, have uh, offered. So again, just so you understand, there's on the maybe the simplest level, there's a fight on the independence of the judiciary system in Israel. And that's in a sense how it all began uh, with these laws being passed in the Judiciary Committee of the Knesset, where our very own Rabbi Gilad Karib was a graduate of Hebrew Union College Israeli program, sits there and fights day after day, and he's usually dragged out physically after five minutes. So when Orly says that Simcha Rotman, who's the member of Knesset, overseeing this, along with Yariv Levine, who's the Minister of Justice, uh, both of them very much um, in cahoots to, to really railroad these decisions as fast and as aggressively as possible, so there's that fight going on, the status of Supreme Court, okay? And if it would end with that, we might be able to say Dayenu, but it's not. And this we hear, heard from both Michal and Orly, that there's also, because of laws, which uh, Michal suggested you look at and be horrified, um, that the, the, the Knesset wants to pass, the, the government, the coalition uh, wants to pass. And again, the opposition is helpless here because it's in the minority. You can't overturn these so-called slim majority uh, decisions that would actually change the nature of the state of Israel. Okay, so therefore the protests are, are so overwhelming and, and, and so uh, resilient and will not stop because we are fighting for the soul of Israel. Uh, that is what the protest movement is about. So I'd like to summarize also what I think has surprised so many of us uh, in the protests, and then of course I'll ask uh, Michal and Orly to respond as well. So no one imagined the force of this pushback, the force, the tenacity, the resilience, the week after week, what Michal said, taking back the flag, taking back the Declaration of Independence, and taking back prophetic Judaism. Even the most secular Tel Aviv, so-called secular Tel Aviv, is not a rally where the call to the prophets of Israel, who are right there in the Declaration of Independence, in a sense, a reform rabbi's dream, they are evoked week 
after week. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micha. Okay, Jew Israelis didn't talk like this before, or haven't talked like this in a long time. So that's one huge surprise. Okay, and here I want to add, and uh, maybe it's my own prejudice, I believe that the decades of work of Hebrew Union College ordaining over 125 rabbis, establishing the Israeli reform movement, establishing 54 synagogues, and NGO, and having our leadership, our graduates of our education program, which, which Michal oversees, but we have put facts on the ground. We have been in the trenches for decades that have helped, we're not lead, we're among the leaders of a, re, a flowering, a Jewish Israeli Renaissance that speaks this language. And it, I think it couldn't have happened in this powerful way without the decades of our hard work. And that's very satisfying to me. No one believed that Israelis would underwrite the protests, that most of the donors over, we, you know, we come crying and fetching and snoring to American Jews, for the first time, Israelis are the biggest backers. The high-tech industry woke up, partially for self-interest, that worried about the economic concern, but partially not just self-interest, understanding that high-tech cannot thrive in a society that's not democratic. So the whole idea that this Israeli funding uh, for this is another surprise, um, and again, the fact that Zionism and Judaism has been reclaimed and, and, and exclaimed uh, we're all over Israel is an example for me, a, a tremendous surprise, which gives me a lot of hope. So Michal, response to that. Thank you. So I agree with you totally. And, uh, and I think also that we got in a way the, the role model of reform uh, jury protesting for human rights all over in a Jewish language. So I think this is something that also is part of helping us in Israel to struggle according to this idea that, you know, now we feel the tension. This, this government tries to say, if you are more Jewish, you are less democratic. And if you are more democratic, you are less Jewish. And I think that what we're trying to yell all over is what the reform people are yelling and crying for many decades. You can, you have to be more Jewish and more democratic. And there are in, in our Jewish tradition, the roots for being more Jewish and more in favor of human rights and in equity and all these ideas of being a liberal Jew. So now I think we are having this language much more, people feel that they need it. One of my surprises is what the head of the um, police said. He said that from the beginning of the protest until now, we got 7 million people out there in the street. So I think this is a huge number. Who would imagine that? And another thing that for me is a, is a surprise. You know, we used to say that the division in Israel is between the secular and the religious people, you know, and, and uh, between uh, right and left wing. And now, and what we feel specifically in Jerusalem, is that is, this is not the, the main uh, division because we're both religious, liberals, and seculars together in this fight. But specifically in Jerusalem, and I will show with you this, um, this uh, picture. If you see in Jerusalem, we have many, many Orthodox people and Haredi people joining us to the protest and a feeling that, you know, their, uh, their leadership is just damaging their lives. So now we see, and specifically in Jerusalem, brave Haredi people and brave uh, the uh, religious Orthodox Zionist people who are saying, you know, the party religious Zionism is not who we are, and now we need to create new covenants with a huge population in Israel, which is not in favor of this kind of Judaism. So, so 
So this is a kind of, a, of a, an important surprise because I think that this gives us the direction to the future. We need to create new covenants in, in the Israeli society. And one thing that I think uh, it's a real threat that we need to, to be careful and work with this. I'm an educator. And uh, a month ago, month ago, educators from the protest came to me saying, look, we feel we can't start this, uh, we can't open the studying year because we are afraid. The school year, which is in September 1, because we don't know how to manage in schools. We have uh, the kids, some of them are violent. Some of them, if they see a teacher who goes to the protest, they can say bad things about her. We don't know what should we say, what shouldn't we say. Now people, teachers are really afraid to be educators because they don't know. One of these laws, these terrible laws is, uh, if you'll see in the suggestions is to, to look at teachers with the Shabak, you know, what, how you say Shabak? Israeli really security. Security yes. service. Security yeah. to look to services see, assessing to teachers. See, yeah, to see if teachers, Not you know, yeah, so so teachers are really afraid. We created um, uh, a conference bringing the teachers and thinking with them what are their sources of power and creating a community of educators that we are reclaiming back the right and their duty to educate and not to be afraid of saying the most important values for them for you know, for the bigger population of human rights, of equality against LGBT discrimination, things that we thought are, you know, common. And we have in this group that created this conference, we had like 250 people coming to the conference and uh, we, we had, uh, uh, we had in, in this group, and I'll show you uh, one picture of the conference. You can see here many people, religious people, people came to, to think together and it was a collaboration with institutions of training teachers with the university with uh, other places that we said together we need to stand behind the teachers and and work with them so they won't be afraid to educate so if i'm thinking of threats and opportunities this is also an opportunity because now teachers in the you know, in, in the bigger system, not only in the secular system, but also in the orthodox system feel that they need to stand uh, for their uh, values and ideologies. So I, Orly, I'm gonna ask you also to respond and maybe I'll, because Michal began to talk about it, our fears and our hopes, and then we'll have another quick round of the last question that I'll ask you and then open it up to, I already see some wonderful questions. So Orly. Yeah, so, so yeah, surprises, talk, hopes, fears. So we spoke about the, I think we spoke about the threats and the fears, and I want to uh, be a little hopeful now, okay, talk about surprises and opportunities. You know, uh, six months ago, I was at Central, I spoke from the Bima uh, on, on Shabbat, and I also gave a talk before, and I think the amazing fact is that six months later, we're, we're still out there on the streets with, as Michal said, millions of Israelis, is just really unbelievable, unheard of. Um, and I keep, um, I was in a conference, so a lot of people said all the eyes of the world are on Israel because this is something like like never before uh, anywhere in the world. So I think that's an amazing surprise. I agree with you, Naama, that it didn't come out of nowhere, okay? It's built on a, on a lot of work, on the work of the reform movement here in Israel. I think uh, our um, um, feelings here at Iraq is that we have been out there you know, Absolutely. raising a voice for Israel, a democratic, pluralistic, and egalitarian Israel for so many years. And now the fact that we have so many Israelis with us saying the same things is amazing. It's really uplifting. It's strengthening. It gives us a lot of power to continue. And I can tell you that this is, uh, you know, the power, you know, every time I go out to a protest, it gives me a lot of energy. So that's in, in and of itself is amazing. But also we are now on a, on a sta in a stage where we have to translate this amazing protests to political change. We had one such success story in June when there were uh, elections to the Bar Association. The Bar Association has representatives in the committee nominating judges. So it was extremely important to prevent the government from gaining control of the Bar Association. And we did this. This was amazing because 
of the awakening of the Israeli liberal public because of the fact that people are not indifferent anymore and now decided to take action. And as I said, the next test is going to be the municipal elections at the, at the end of October. And it's clear that the voter turnout would be higher and that people now care, both the voters and the mayors. I can tell you that I live in Mevaser Zion, a suburb of Jerusalem. My mayor is from the Likud, but now he is pushing for a liberal education in school. He has started to operate public transportation on Shabbat by the municipality. Wow. He is making sure that women's images, female images are not vandalized. He has events with Abu Ghosh, the Arab village nearby against the terrorist attacks. So we see that there is a change in the local level and uh, that is like never before. And that's amazing. And I'm sure we'll see political change in the municipal elections. I can also tell you that the power of the public in and of itself can change reality. Just a small example, um, two months ago, uh, a pharmacy in Bnei Brak, an ultra-Orthodox city, decided to put stickers on images of women on hair products because God forbid you can't see female images. Uh, we have been dealing with such cases for many years and up until now we had to take those cases to court and it would take many years until we reach a result. Uh, this time within hours, the Israeli public just blew with, you know, uh, with enraged. And because of the pressure of the Israeli public, the pharmacy had to change its policy within two days. And it's clear that now the Israeli public is not willing to accept such phenomenon anymore. And I can tell you that even this government uh, is susceptible to public pressure. And there have been a few laws that the, the government um, said it's going to promote, and then they had to retract because of the response of the public. For instance, the issue of uh, the Kotel, the Western law, they wanted to have a law about non-Orthodox prayer at the law and about modest clothing at the, at the, at the, at the wall. And they had to stop it because of the, the response of the public. So it's clear Israel, liberal Israelis understand we have a lot of power in our hands and we can make a difference. And the fact that we have so many partners now is, is just uh, tremendous. And I think it's a very optimistic uh, message. So I think we, we want to share, if we haven't, um, our greatest fear. I think you've heard, heard a lot about our hopes. And then uh, I'll ask Michal and Orly to say something. What we, we expect, hope, dream of uh, partnering with uh, American Jews. And then we'll have time for questions. So I'll just say, put it out there. It was also on a question, my biggest fear, of course. And it was asked by the Supreme Court, a Supreme Court justice, Orly can tell me which one. What if elections are canceled? I think that many of us, our biggest fear, is someone wrote, how come they're still in power? Well, they're still in power, this current government, because they have 64 people who will not budge and vote together as a block. And we fantasize that maybe five or six of them will bolt at some point. There are some hints of that. Um, and, the, and they will accept a Supreme Court decision. And it's still, uh, Netanyahu has not said that he would accept. Uh, he only says it in English occasionally. He doesn't say it in Hebrew. Um, so I think that's some of our biggest fears, that there would be every attempt to limit, um, and this may sound familiar, and here I speak as an American as well, uh, very, many of us are very fearful about elections and keeping them fair and open and honest. Um, and of course, there's the hope also that Buzi Herzog, uh, Isaac Herzog, the president, has been in his quiet way fighting hard to reach a compromise there are a lot of groups underway. I happen to be in at least two of them that are trying to present a compromise between the extremes because we're moderates. We don't want to destroy the very fabric, the very foundations that we live by. So there are huge efforts to reach some kind of compromises with these basic laws. So that's one thing I wanted to put out there and orally something about that. And because I really, Want to open this up for questions? Something you want to ask for from our uh, companions? Yeah. Our... <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I I spoke about the involvement and the activism of Israelis, but uh, it, it's the fact that we know that so many uh, Jews outside of Israel care and are committed to a democratic um, um, and and truly pluralistic uh, uh, Israel 
is, is amazing. It's really meaningful to us. It helps us. Uh, your support, your involvement is tremendous. So I first of all, I urge you to uh, follow uh, you know, what's actually uh, happening. Um, and I invite you to sign up for our newsletter. I put it uh, on the chat. I think that's a good way to understand what's actually going on. We sometimes have a call to action, ask people to write email, uh, have email campaigns to uh, Israeli officials, um, and also ask any organization you're a part of to be involved to raise a voice for a democratic and Jewish Israel. I think it's not only your right, it's your duty. Uh, Israel is the homeland of all Jews, and it is supposed to be the home uh, for you. And all of us want to make sure that the only Jewish state uh, remains a democracy. So I urge you to be involved and to uh, stay uh, updated. Um, I hope that this situation uh, will lead to a new beginning. You know, we're on the eve of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, so we are in a troubled situation, but also with a lot of hope. Uh, and, you know, in a few weeks, we're going to reach uh, week 40 of the demonstrations. After four weeks, there is birth, right? So the pregnancy ends and there will be birth and it's going to coincide very closely to Shabbat Bereshit to start the starting, the beginning of reading of the Torah. So I see uh, a, a new beginning, a hope for maybe a new covenant between the Israeli, uh, different factors of Israeli society, uh, maybe a constitution. You know, we have really reached the deepest uh, issues of uh, the fundamental issues of Israel. And that could be a time for a new beginning in a new year for a real uh, democracy in Israel. Michal. What, would you, what do we want from our partners? What do we hope well, I'm for? Gonna, I want to tell you my own story. And then, you know, I don't know really uh, what you can do. I, I can tell you what we're doing and hope that you will be uh, thinking in a, in a creative way and that you'll care. But I want to say that I started being so involved without knowing, without even imagining that I will be a part of this huge movement. You know, at the beginning, a friend of mine just sent me a WhatsApp saying, let's think what we can do. And then we gather in an evening thinking what we can do. And then we decided maybe we should go to, we should go to Tel Aviv to the protest. And then after that, we said, oh my God, we need to protest in Jerusalem. And, and the week after- we Michal, wrote, who was this person? Maybe mention who this person okay, was. Okay, so it was Guy Schwarz. He was a head of a school, a middle school, and he just sent a WhatsApp asking people to come. So And he's a we, graduate of one of your programs at yeah, HBO. Of Teacher's Lounge. Lounge. Yeah, of Teacher's Lounge. But, uh, so I want to say, just, and, and I'm a professor of education. I never thought that I will be, you know, standing up there, bringing people to talk in the stage, yelling. And, and so just, uh, thinking that, oh, what can we do? We are, uh, you know, I'm a professor of education. Can I do anything? I'm not kind of that person who was yelling in the streets. But if you can see, these are people who are taking their time just to, uh, just to, you know, to put the flags in the, in the maklot, I don't know you say that, and to, uh, to travel from place to place and to bring things, from place to the other. So I, I want to say, just think that you can. Yes, we can. Is also, yes, we can step out from our regular lives and go out there and yell for things that we do care. We can't just keep staying on the sofa and just thinking, oh my God, what's going to happen? And the second thing that I want to show you is the creativity of this um of this protest. So one that Oli mentioned and-, and Sense of humor too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because, because lots of humor is really helping us to deal with this uh, heartbreaking issue. So if you see here in the middle, after uh, ruining pictures of, of women in one of the neighborhoods, uh, Beta Kerem, so we, we joined to the women of Beta Kerem and, and asked for women to send us their own pictures we created those huge um, posters. Signs, posters and we went in the night putting them all over the city and putting them on the bridges. So you see Jerusalem bridges with faces of, of women. You can see me here, you can see Dalia Marx here, you can see many, many Orthodox and, and Reform and secular women, all ages up there on the, on the all over. 
Also, when uh, uh, one of the, you know, a, a student, a high tech, Ole Hadash from America, he, a new immigrant, he decided to, to um, ask from AliExpress these this dinosaurs uh, customs. And there were like 20 people coming with these customs saying dinosaurs were uh, dis dismissed and we are not going to dismiss democracy. And so just thinking, and now we're uh, about to send this new Shana Tova to, uh, to many people. We have a group of uh, protest uh, artists who are creating many ideas. So if I wanna say, just be creative and care for Israel and do something that you really, uh, that is with humor, that brings your hopes, and be with us. You can be updated. We have also in safeguarding our shared home. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group, which we will put there. So uh, you can join this WhatsApp group and just know what we're doing. Please come to Israel and join us in front of the president's house and, and be with us. You can join us every Mosei Shabbat in Facebook. And also you can, you know, since the biggest organizations, I don't know if they donate to this protest. But we ask from our people that come every Mutzah Shabbat to participate in donating because putting a stage and putting such signs in the street, it costs so much money and we don't have, you know, uh, we are very new. So people are really, uh, as Nami said, people are really donating money every week. So you're just invited to be a part of this and also protest whenever, wherever you are. Since we mentioned Bibi is coming, there, People are coming to the state. Be with us. It's important so to let's ask. let's take some time. And I return. Thank you so much, Orly Michal. Amazing, Rabbi Berman. I know there are a lot of questions. You're going to have to be King Solomon here and pick a few, <laughs> and maybe direct them if you can direct them. Sure. Uh, or I together we can direct them. Perfect. We have some really great questions. Um, I'm going to start with a question from our friend Rabbi Nicole Auerbach asking about how does the use of Hatikva and other national symbols affect your ability to include the voices of Israeli Arabs? Okay, so uh, from the beginning, uh, we brought uh, our Arab partners to the stage and also, you know, behind the stage, we are in a constant um, discussion with, uh, with Arabs. Uh, this is the anthem of our country. So we're not going to switch it now, but I think that many people got aware of how uneasy it is for, it is for the Arabs to, to sing this anthem. So I think that what happened now, since we bring, you know, in Jerusalem specifically, we bring so many Arab speakers and we, talk, we have, you know, encounters behind the scenes with Arabs, which in Jerusalem and other places in Israel, the, the, their situation is different. But uh, since we bring it to the stage, people are starting to understand how hard is it to be an Arab in Israel and also specifically in Jerusalem. So, you know, we, we can't and we don't want to take out this anthem now without a huge discussion. We want to say we are fighting for our country and for our Arab citizens and those who are not citizens and live in Jerusalem, this is really hard and we don't want to, to put it uh, back. We want to say that out loud. It's not easy and this is what we do. I can maybe add just, just in, a, in a word that I think it's it's the symbols are part of it. Of course, a sea of Israeli flags makes it very hard for Israeli Palestinians to join the protests, but I think it's deeper than that. I think a lot of uh, Arabs living here in Israel do not feel uh, that Israel treated them equally. Uh, we have been um, uh, fighting uh, discrimination against Arabs for many, many years. And so for them, they feel alienated uh, and, and reluctant to join the protest. So I think it, it's deeper than that. It's clear people completely understand that while we now have tools to fight discrimination, if a legal coup would be implemented fully, we would not have such tools. So it's clear that I understand that the situation could be worse. But um, I think, you know, having the symbols of the Israeli flags and the Israeli anthem means that we have a very 
broad spectrum of uh, the Jewish population from different uh, opinions, like uh, Michal said, and from different sectors. Unfortunately, this means that we do not have, as protesters, uh, a lot of Israeli Arabs. Like, like Michal said, I think there are more and more issues pertaining to the Arab uh, sector in Israel that are being brought uh, center stage and, and in speakers all around the country. Yama, you are muted. <laughs> I just had next question. <laughs> okay, great. Um, Elliot, Rabbi Elliot Strom would has a, a um, question about what will happen. What do you think will happen if the Supreme Court overrules the coalition's reasonableness law? Um, do, do you think it will push the country towards civil war? Do you think it would show the power of the resistance and curtail the government's push for power? Do you think it might lead to a compromise? So that's a very good question. A lot of people talk about the constitutional crisis, which are on the verge of. Uh, if the court indeed strikes down the law, then it remains to be seen whether the government uh, um, actually respects it. But we're we are actually going, well, first, of course, they can declare that they would not respect it. And they've already said uh, a lot of declarations to that extent. But in fact, we'll have to wait for the next case where someone would bring a petition on the basis of reasonableness the court would accept it, and then a minister who the court said what he said is unreasonable, what he decided is unreasonable, would decide to do it anyway. So it's like the next case will be the real test to see whether uh, indeed they're actually respecting the, this um, uh, decision or not. Um, it's clear that the heads of, it seems that like the army, the police, I believe that they will respect the decision of the court. By the way, if the court would reject the petitions, the protest leaders already said that, of course, we're going to respect the court's decision no matter what. Um, but but it, it, you know, other than uh, very uh, blunt declarations of the chairperson of the Knesset, of the prime minister, of other ministers who keep threatening the court not to intervene, it remains to be seen whether actually things are going to happen. So I don't think that if the court renders a decision tomorrow, we'll have a civil war. It's definitely going to, to cause the rift and the polarization in Israeli society to get to be to get deeper. Uh, but you know, we'll have to wait and see until like the next case in order for us to Marley, see. can you add a word about the past? A lot of talk about finally composing uh, an Israeli constitution. How feasible is this uh, in the near future? So I think one of the good news is that Israelis have become very aware of the constitutional uh, situation. You know, just a few months ago, nobody in Israel who is not a lawyer mm -hmm. didn't know anything about the basic law, how do you enact the basic law, how do you like judges, and suddenly everyone knows constitutional law. So if I take a cab, like the cab driver would start lecturing to me about uh, the constitutional law in Israel, which is just, just unbelievable. Um, and I think it really brought to the surface the need once and for all to create this you know regulation of how do we enact a law what is uh, our our constitution so i think more and more israelis now understand that we need to address the issue because the situation we are in is is unhealthy okay even if we uh, cross this crisis we're going to be in the same path again maybe in a few months time or a few years uh, so, of course, the ideal situation is to have a constitution. And by the way, this is what David Ben-Gurion wanted. And that's what's written in the Declaration of Independence. We, we were supposed to have a constitution by October 1st, 1948. It just never happened because we couldn't agree on anything. Now, I think now the society is much more polarized than it was in 1948. So in this sense, it's it seems like a distant dream. On the other hand, I think the awareness of the Israeli public is much uh, higher now. People understand that in order for our rights to be protected, in order for our institutions to be protected, we need to have this uh, constitution, which wouldn't be able to be changed on a whim of a very simple majority coalition majority. So I don't have a clear answer. I know that's on the agenda now of many, many people, um, and we'll have to wait and see how things evolve. I want to say that that uh, in in all the questionnaires, it's like the seventy percent of the Israeli population are against uh, this uh, revolution. So you know, we, several of them would would be in favor of doing it in agreement, but most of the Israeli population is is not in favor of this revolution. 
Yeah, it's important and to I say add, yeah, the government does not have uh, any public support on almost any issue, let alone the, the legal coup, which is completely against even a lot of the coup voters. Right. In yeah. other words, all the polls show the current government losing in any mm. round of elections, and that's another reason they're clinging to, to right. each other. So all the polls show that they no longer have, if you believe in polls. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> Sarah, so, together, yeah. maybe one more question and then uh, we can say Shana Tova to each other. Perfect. Um, our, our most uh, uh, frequently asked questions are about the Constitution and whether you think that in this climate it would be possible to create a Constitution. And I would add to those questions what do you think all sides, all Israelis might agree belongs in a Constitution? Well, I think, you know, we, we definitely need to have the uh, a relationship between the different powers of government uh, in the Constitution, and especially who has the last word in striking down the law or reenacting the law. And we need to have a Bill of Rights. So today we do not have uh, a detailed Bill of Rights. We have just one basic law, which does not even mention the word equality. We don't have equality in our Constitution, which is something that is unheard of in any other democratic uh, country. So it's clear that we need human rights to be protected in a way that not any government would be able to change them. Because this, you know, we reached the situation now. We had protection of the Supreme Court over the years who developed a protection, even not all the words are mentioned in the law just through legal cases. And now the government wants basically to take it and just throw it um, uh, to the garbage, all of these protections. And I think more Israelis understand that any one of us could find him or herself in a minority and in need of protection of the Supreme Court or of some kind of mechanism. And the problem with Israeli democracy is that we do not have any checks and balances on the power of the government. The government controls the Knesset, and if it's going to control the courts, and we have no two houses of parliament and no uh, other, other mechanism that could protect us, then any majority could do whatever it wants. And Nana, you mentioned one of the judges, uh, Judge Anat Baron, who said, what if, uh, you know, one of the, the, I think it was the government attorney said uh, in court, well, he was asked by the courts, okay, if the court does, cannot strike down unreasonable decisions, then who has review over the government? And he said, well, the people, the people could go and vote. And then one of the judges said, but what if the government says, well, there's no elections anymore? Of course, he didn't have any answer for that because that's a very basic and fundamental question. We have to make sure not to reach this. And I can tell you that learning from other autocracies in the world, we have a different uh, set of measures that uh, dem democracies do in, uh, when they turn into autocracies. And we are in this list. And the last measure is canceling the elections. So we have to make sure we do not reach this measure because then it would be too late. The good news is that unlike Hungary and Poland and other places, Israelis went out to the streets very early, um, led by Michal and many others. And we are out there and we would not let this happen. And I think together with so many of you, uh, I'm sure we will succeed in blocking this. I want to say a word about, uh, not, not about the constitution, which Orly just spoke beautifully about, but about the mechanism that we need in order to create deep agreements. In, in our society. I think it's not only about the, the judicial area, but it's also about educating our society that things are not done in power, that things are not done in, in violence of the, of the, you know, um, of the rov, of the majority. Things have to be done after deep discussions and in agreements, and we need to create, educate ourselves to, to this kind of processes, which we hoped will happen in the Knesset, but we don't see them. I think we need to start doing this in all the educational areas and not just to uh, wish that it will happen in the Knesset. We need to educate ourselves to do that. So I just wanna, maybe I'll end speaking for all of us that uh, Israel is an incredible country and one of its probably strongest resources are its people. Uh, for whatever reason, our electoral system doesn't actually necessarily <laughs> reflect the strength, the creativity, the vitality, the promise, the innovation of, of the citizens of Israel. Um, 
And I think all of us get re-energized every week when we meet in the streets and see exactly the power. And hopefully this will change um, in, in the uh, electoral, in the, in the electric, electoral boxes in, in the future. And we will, we will just keep at it. So as you know, this is year 84, 5784. And in Hebrew, uh, our, num our letters are numbers. So we have a pay and we have a dalid. So I would suggest that pay stands for pius, which is reconciliation, coming together. And dalid, of course, is democratia. <laughs> democratia, pius, the democratia may be a year of coming together and celebrating democracy everywhere because our prophets knew this without that word that a compassionate, caring, vital, vibrant, creative society must be based on these values of equality, of justice, of care. So thank you very much. And I just wanna add a very personal note that the central um, Zooms kept me going so much of COVID. <laughs> so I feel this is the little I can do to pay back so many wonderful broadcasts that literally kept us through. So thank you for your ongoing support. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our community for showing up for this incredible hour of learning. I'm going into the new year inspired to be with be with my friends in Israel and to, to fight and to support. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you all at services, either through the camera lens or in our pews. And Nama, um, uh, we're so grateful that you will join us on our Bima tomorrow at David Geffen Hall. Shana Tova, and thank you so much to everybody. Shana Tova, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye.